Good afternoon, everybody. I apologize, we're having some sound difficulties. We're trying to get back participation in, in the church with singing and music and all those things. So just be patient with us with all of that. Well, anyway, I, I hope that uh, many of you have had the chance this summer to have gone on vacation. Maybe uh, you have been on vacation already. Maybe you're planning on vacation the rest of the summer, some point before the school year starts. Or maybe uh, we have some visitors here uh, this afternoon who are with us who are on vacation. If so, welcome. We're glad that you're here. You know, in general, I was thinking about this, there are two different extremes when it comes to vacation. So think about it. There are, on the one hand, the super planners. You know who you are. The super planners are those people who have everything planned out to the T. They have the whole itinerary of their vacation planned out, maybe not just every day, but every hour of their vacation. They have a really long packing list. They have their budget planned out, every place they're going to go, every event that they're going to experience, everything they're going to see. It's all planned out to the T perfectly. So those of you who are super planners, you know who you are. And then, on the other hand, there are people like me. There are the kind of chill vacationer. You know, if you're like me, you try to get those last second deals at the hotel. So you wait till a week before to book your hotel. Or you pack an hour before you leave on your trip. Or you, you know, just have no idea what you're going to do day by day. You just take it one day at a time and try to experience the vacation that way. If you're like me, you're the kind of super chill vacation or just trying to be spontaneous. Now, when it comes down to it, neither of those ex extremes is wrong. It sort of depends on your personality. But here's the thing. If you're the super planner, and if something goes out of whack, if uh, something is more expensive than you think it is, if something is closed and you didn't expect it to be, if even there's a, a, a problem with the weather, you can get all panicked and freak out. And on the other hand, for the chill person who doesn't plan anything, you show up at something and it's closed, well, it's your fault. You didn't plan for it. You try to go to this event or this place and you can't see it because you, uh, you had no idea that there was construction or something. Or you try to, you, uh, you show up at your place and you have to buy all this extra stuff because you didn't pack it. So the two extremes, there's, no, there's nothing wrong with either except we are looking for balance. We all need a certain balance and equilibrium in our life because why do we go on vacation? We go on vacation to relax, to be refreshed, to be recreated as God wants us to find a certain recreation and peace. And, and why do we go? That's why do we go. So therefore, we have to sort of meet in the middle, right? To plan a little bit for these guys over here and to maybe just be flexible a little, little bit for those who are the super planner. Well, anyway, today is uh, the second week of a summer message series I've called Eucharistic Amazement. Eucharistic Amazement, and we're looking at the Gospel of John, chapter 6, which we've been hearing. Uh, we're going to hear it for the next four weeks in our Gospel reading. The Gospel of John is sometimes called the Bread of Life Discourse. It's so important as we begin to come back to worship, as we begin to come back to church in person, that we understand why we're doing a little more deeply. Why do we come and connect with our Lord as we worship? Why do we have liturgical ministry? Why do we, what, why do we have to come to Mass, as the bishop says, and, you know, as the church teaches us? Why do we have to do all these things and, and uh, experience the Mass and the liturgy and the Eucharist the way we do. Well, last week we looked at the beginning of John chapter 6, the story of the multiplication of the loaves. We said that the real presence of Christ here as we gather at Mass is greater than any celebrity, it's greater than any sports figure, it's greater than even if the Pope would show up, because here we get to encounter the living Christ who feeds us and nourishes us and we get to participate in God's redemption of the world here, experiencing that same miraculous presence of Christ. 
and the church calls us to a full, conscious, active participation. That is, we are not spectators in our faith and our religion. Our Catholic faith is not a spectator sport. We're called to that participation both externally, especially when we worship at Mass through song and response, but also internally, the way we lift up our hearts to God in prayer and respond to his presence and his challenge to us every week when we come here. Well, today we continue the story of John chapter 6, and some interesting things are going to happen here. So Jesus has fed this 5,000. They are amazed at his miraculous power. They want more. And today we're going to see how Jesus leads on the crowd. He leads them to where he wants them to go, not just to a different place, but to a different understanding, a deeper belief and deeper knowledge of him. So first of all, Jesus comes to Capernaum. Capernaum is on the north of the Sea of Galilee. It will be Jesus' home base, his kind of adopted home while he ministers among the people in Galilee. And the, the big crowd that has experienced this miracle, their tummies are filled with bread, they get word of where Jesus is, and so they follow him. However, they're not prepared for their journey. You know, they just want him to do the miracle again, to feed their stomachs again. That's important. They don't quite understand who they're following. They just know he's an amazing miracle worker, and they don't prepare for their journey. So we know that later, later on this story, from some context at the end of John chapter 6, that Jesus goes to Capernaum, and he's inside the synagogue there. That's important. He's teaching in the synagogue and preaching, and probably the scripture that is being read is that first reading we heard from Exodus chapter 16, the whole story about the manna in the desert. What's that? The manna in the desert is what God provided for the people of Israel as they wandered for 40 years in the desert. They had complained against God and against Moses. If you're familiar with the story, they complained that God was not providing for them. He would just leave them for dead there in the desert. And so this mysterious substance God gave on the desert floor, on the sand, it tastes like bread. It sort of has a, a contact, uh, it, it sort of tastes like bread, and, and we call this manna. So God provided for them. It was enough for 40 years in their desert wandering to the promised land. So like Moses, Jesus is gathered with this big crowd. They're on a journey, they're hungry, and Jesus is going to take an, the opportunity to lead them and us from their physical hunger, from their empty bellies and their lack of understanding to faith in him. So the crowd, again, they don't understand. They ask this very interesting question. They ask, what can we do to accomplish the works of God? What can we do to accomplish the works of God? So the people there have just gone to some great effort to follow Jesus. They've worked hard in a way in their journey, and they want something in return from this miracle worker. Do that bread thing again for us. You know, sometimes, if you, if you think about it, we're similar in our questioning, in our relationship with God. We're very similar. Sometimes we're just merely looking to please God. We're merely looking to please Him by our correct behavior. And then in turn, when we disobey God, we feel shame and separation from God. So we're, we're looking to accomplish the works of God. And sometimes we do everything right. And this can be even worse. When we do everything right and then we don't get what we want, we can get angry with God. And it all comes down to this. We give in to a common lie that we need to earn God's favor. We give in to a lie that we need to earn God's favor by our works. And Jesus answers the crowd in a very strange way. When they ask him this question, what can we do to accomplish the works of God? Jesus says, this is the work of God that you believe in the one he sent. If you think about it, that's strange for Jesus to say because we don't associate work and belief. Oh, Jesus is turning the crowd's attention away from their empty bellies, their hungry stomachs, to him. 
If people don't understand, they're looking for another miracle, another sign. They're looking for a whole lifetime supply of bread. Because they say, give us this bread always. And then, at last, Jesus says this. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger. Whoever believes in me will never thirst. Well, Jesus provides for them. He provides for us. And that's what he wants us to come to faith in. So, what can we take out of this story today, this part of John chapter 6? Well, Jesus' provision never runs out. He is the true bread of life. And in coming to church, we can get a little answer to that why question. We don't come to church merely to earn God's favor. We don't come to the altar to worship God, to check off obligations, or to follow rules. In fact, we can't earn God's favor anyway. There's nothing we can do in this world to earn God's favor. He gives us his favor already. So why do we come each week? Why do we come and connect with the Lord? We come to be nourished by Jesus, the bread of life. We are on a journey of life, all of us. And in that active practice of our faith, we are going to be provided for in faith. Why then do we serve? If you think about it, why do we have all these ministry? Why do we have a deacon on the altar? Why do we have musicians right here? Why do why why does anybody buddy serve their neighbor? Why do we help the poor? If we are not earning God's favor for it, why do we bother? Well, just like there are two types of vacationers, there's the super prepared, and there's the chill people. You know, we can go through different seasons in life. Sometimes things are going to be going great in our life. Sometimes our family is happy, work is great, our friends in our school are great, we experience all these blessings. It's God provide, who's provided all these things, but sometimes when things are great, we can tend to forget about God. We can easily forget that God's the source of all those blessings. So on the one hand, when things are great, that's when we need to serve to realize in serving that we have been provided for. And then, of course, there are seasons in our life when things are not going so well. We're going to need the nourishment from God and from others. We can't pay our bills. We're failing out of school. There's a family situation that's so overwhelming. A health crisis has happened. We can't get a vacation because we're so busy right now. We're deeply depressed. We feel all alone. And that's when we cry out to God to help us. We might even think that God's punishing us. So that's our motivation to go back to church. God wants to sort of turn the tables on our thinking. He wants to, us to remind us always that we can trust in Him. He provides the good and bad in our journey in life. He is the bread of life. We can't earn our salvation. But we can be prepared, no matter in good or bad. We prepare by our, for our spiritual journey by realizing the source of our blessing. You know, in times are good, that's when we can give back, realizing the source of our blessing. And then when times are bad, we have faith and we have hope that Jesus will provide for us and guide us through. In our participation in church, when we gather here and we serve, we have, and there are many people who are able to serve, many people who can't, can't serve, maybe they used to in some way. We are sharing God's provision. We are sharing the gifts and time and talent that God has given us, the gifts of music and song that God has given us, perhaps through welcoming, through hospitality. We're sharing just the smile, and Christ has given us that joy. And when we bring Christ to the homebound, like our ministers do who bring the Eucharist to those at home, we are providing that bread of life to others. It's a privilege to do so. So this week, the one thing I just ask you to do is this. Think about your service through your life, the ways that you served in past or present. Have you ever given in to that lie, that lie that you are trying to earn God's favor through your service? Ask yourself, why did you serve? Why do you serve? We serve, ideally, because Jesus, the bread of life, has nourished us. He has provided for us first. We are privileged 
we are empowered to be his hands and feet in the world. Oh, in participating in service, we're feeding others with Christ's presence. Christ desired that we all come to him, that we all come to worship him, to be fed by him, to have faith in him. He is the bread of life who alone satisfies our souls. Amen.